Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current show, On the Grid, curated by Kelly Dietrich. Today, we are thrilled to present the artist, Emily Sullivan-Smith. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Feel free to utilize that chat function and ask questions. We'll be sure to get to them at the end of the talk. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thanks all and welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Kat. A big thank you to the Ohio Arts Council and the Rife Gallery for having me. And in particular to Kelly Dietrich for curating this really beautiful and thoughtful exhibition. Um, if you haven't also seen the curator's walkthrough of the show, I give a high recommend to that. So I'm going to talk today about all of the usual suspects that we do when we give artist talks. <clears throat> but I would like to put a special emphasis on the influences that have gotten me to the work that I'm making now. I'll go a little bit through the history of um, how my work is developed and show you also some artists that have, have uh, influenced me along the way. So like Kat said, my name is Emily Sullivan Smith. I'm an associate professor and foundations coordinator at the University of Dayton. I have a BFA in printmaking and sculpture and an MFA in printmaking. And all of those degrees are from Kent State University, uh, which I think is an excellent program. I'm very proud to be an alum of that space. So my art making career, I think, really started when I was very young. This is an image of me sitting on the beach um, looking at shells, which is a pastime that I could have done for hours and hours. The process of looking and awareness has always been something that has been imperative to me. Slow reading, slow looking, slow observation. I had as a child, um, as I look back on it, a real sense of wonder and curiosity and a deep relationship with the natural world. So I remember the word being sensitive, um, being thrown around about me, but that sensitivity has really been one of the greatest assets that I have as an artist and as a maker. Um, and it's led me to a lot of the projects that I've made. So we'll talk a little bit about um, my relationship with the natural world and how that sensitivity has really been the guiding force ultimately. My becoming and being an artist um, wouldn't be without my family. I had a huge, diverse set of influences as a child. This slide represents my paternal grandparents. Um, I went to manners classes at and my grandmother had her colors done at the department store. We traveled a significant amount. Um, access to culture and museums was really imperative and important. Um, academic thinking was something that we were really, my siblings and I were really attuned to uh, from them. And just really access to information. These grandparents to me felt like if we could dream it, they would help us get access to it. Um, so that has really been influential and, and critical to me as an artist and as a maker. My maternal set of grandparents were had a very different upbringing. They grew up in Appalachia, which has a high influence on the work that I'm currently making, which I'll show you at the end. Um, but sustenance living, how do they farm and preserve food and make quilts and really have a connection to life that that is from the land um, and from community and from each other. And uh, this has also had a huge influence on my work, in particular, the kind of labor that goes into um, just sustaining our lives. I think my parents are on this Zoom, so they'll love this. This is the slide that represents um, my upbringing as a kid. It was very middle class. I grew up in the 80s. Um, kids were allowed to roam in neighborhoods, which was fantastic. I remember once getting in trouble for checking in too often, which I think is um, a thing of the past at this point. Um, it was a really fun upbringing where the dinner table was critical um, and being learning to think and read uh, was also really critical. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the influences of my family. In my own work, these are words that have stuck with me <clears throat> from the very beginning. I'm incredibly curious and I love 
things. I love to imagine making things. And oftentimes I'm making them because I want to see what happens at the end. So labor and process um, is something that I like to live within. It's not something that I'm trying to get through to get to the end product. I love the idea of accumulation and thousands of tiny little things, replication of the natural world, and then these shared cultural languages that we all have access to that I can pull from as a maker to solicit different kinds of ideas. So going back to my family a little bit, um, my grandparents had my siblings and I at the Cleveland Museum of Art all the time as children. And because it was the late 80s and early 90s, we were permitted to just roam around um, without any adult supervision. And I spent a lot of time with works like this by Martin Purrier and wondered as a child how something like this would be made that seemed so perfect that it was almost inhuman. How do you get a piece of wood to bend into this beautiful uh, multi-layered sphere? Agnes Martin's The City was also a, a piece that um, is sort of a joke in our family. My dad likes to talk to me about, um, about this piece, but as a child, it was really critical to look at this and he would say, you know, why is this here? Why is this art? And I, I did truly wonder um, what the answer was to that and sought it out uh, to figure out what the minimalists were really considering. What a dream, right? These are the questions that I was asking myself as a child. Um, what were the minimalists asking? Why is this called the city? How is Agnes Martin a, cart a cartographer? And it really was a question that lasted with me through my education. Anselm Kiefer's piece uh, was one that I always felt drawn to, and this goes back to the material language. For me, this piece is not archival. I have to imagine that it's a, a nightmare for the conservators at Cleveland Museum of Art. You can see all of the materials that are used down below. Um, and it was the first piece that I remember thinking that the materials were the language of the artwork itself. Oh, and Philip Perlstein, the, the use of color on this artwork, it's one that I probably stood in front of for <laughs> multiple hours, all told, in my life. Um, but the way that he's really looking at the body is, is something that I'm not quite over yet. In all of his work, his use of shadow and color um, to really, again, show us how he's looking and perceiving this work. In the 90s, the Akron Art Museum had the first comprehensive solo show of Liza Liu's work. And she, this piece for me was one of those moments where I thought, oh, I really want to be an artist. If she's doing this, I definitely want to be doing this as well. So this piece is called um, Backyard and it's all beaded by hand with seed beads. So we have a close up here. You can see that all of the grass Every object is meticulously beaded with um, seed beads. And one of the things that really struck me, aside from the labor, is that Liza Liu had people working with her, including the parking lot attendant, <laughs> wherever she was, um, helping her to make this piece come to life. So just the amount of work that went into something, the idea that you could have a community that was part of your practice, um, and that all of that was adding up to this new cultural experience or statement uh, was really imperative. The other part of this work is that it's so mundane, right? This is just a backyard and she's made it so incredibly special by the use of her labor. And I don't think that it would be right if I didn't talk about Agnes Martin and her use of the grid, um, the very simple questions that she asks herself that led to a full lifetime of curiosity uh, will never cease to be something that I look at. And last on my artist influence is the op artists that came out of Joseph Albers and Black Mountain College, but um, Julian Stanchek certainly for the simplicity of a uh, way that he's thinking as complex as this work is, I think it's three or four colors all told, and it's all about that optical blending. So as an artist and a maker, when we look through all of those artists that I just listed, there are really critical questions that these folks are asking about big ideas and then paring them down, thinking about materials, 
um, really focusing in on formalism and con uh, formalism and concept, and then bringing forward these new and beautiful ideas. So in the real world out there, um, there's a suite of things that always catch my eye. And this has been true of me since I was a child and definitely through my undergrad and absolutely through my graduate school and on to now. Systems of growth in nature. So how are things growing? What happens when a spider builds a web? How do these lichens attach to the tree and start forming themselves? And so I have studied those, and you'll see that in some of my work, that I'm actually looking at a spider and watching her build a web and then doing that same thing myself. I'm also deeply interested and invested in watching for places where the natural world and the human world collide, and there's some sort of balance or imbalance. Um, I've always lived in suburbia where there's a lot of roads, so travel has been um, a huge thing for me to see other kinds of environments. And this is Andrew Moore's work. Um, uh, these are images that are coming out of Detroit right before or right during the um, global financial crisis in 2008. These are places that uh, humans had stopped visiting and the natural world had taken over. So here we're seeing moss that's grown in the Model T headquarters offices. Material is one of the loves of my life, most certainly, and Janine Antoni has been um, a great artist to look at. This is her piece called Lick and Lather, where she took busts of herself and licked the chocolate and then soaped up the head to show this amount of wear. And I just love the physicality of those works. And also thinking about the relationship that we have to those ideas. So the artist is using the materials and their labor and that process to bring ideas into the viewer's head um, and help to create a personal experience with them. This is the last artist slide that I'll show you, but Lorna Simpson's uh, Three Wishbones. This is an additioned piece. I've had the distinct pleasure of seeing it in person and it really is incredible. But this piece, what it requires of folks is to enter into the gallery as a human with a human body and their, all of their human experiences and think about what this means for them. So each of these wishbones is made from a different material. And what Lorna Simpson is asking the viewer to do is think about um, copper or whatever the, the metal component happens to be and how that relates to the wishbone and put that meaning together for themselves. So that's been something that I've um, played around with in my own practice. The last and greatest influence has been this quote by Marina Abramovich. She is a performance artist and I got to see her retrospective a few years ago. And she says... The deeper you dive into yourself, the more universal you come out on the other side. And I was talking to Kat before this started and telling her about my teaching practice, which is all part of my artistic practice, and telling her that what I'm noticing right now is that we're really asking students to consider who they are and what their place in the world is and how they can use their voice to mark this time and culture. So that sort of self-knowing process that we go through as artists and makers, um, it's really truly the guiding force for us to listen to. So what does it mean to be an artist of now? All of that to say, here are the things that I'm making artwork about. I talked earlier about being a very sensitive child in particular with my relationship with the natural world. And if you remember back, there was a slide of a deer that had been killed, that had been hunted and killed in the back of a truck. That was one of my earliest memories of having this awareness of my sensitivity. Uh, my grandfather was a hunter and a very responsible hunter at that. Um, it wasn't the fact that he hunted that bothered me. It was just the fact that I couldn't cope. I couldn't cope with that. Um, in the same way that I can't cope with this kind of destruction of the natural world. It's something that sits in me um, in sort of a, an agitating and aggressive way. And the only thing that I know to do with that is to make artwork about it. <laughs> so on the left, you see fishing nets um, coming to shore in the ocean. And on the right, this is an image of the Nile River. 
I had a friend from high school who was visiting the site and it's all filled with plastic water bottles. And it was really mind boggling for me to see this thing that I thought of as so extraordinary and to see it um, in this sort of state of destruction. So that prompted me to make, these are very early works, um, but this, that prompted me to make all of these works where I was sort of reimagining that plastic, turning into um, these sort of well curated islands. What would happen if instead of it being a terrible thing, we made our own private islands out of these uh, where we could each vacation in this sort of lovely way. So this tongue in cheek turn on what was something that I couldn't really cope with into something that um, maybe had a little bit more hope, but also invited the viewer to question their place in all of this. So I've included quite a few process shots. I love seeing those in other artists' presentations, uh, but this piece was printed at a, an event called Really Big Prints in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. So you can see the scale of that block. It is really huge. It's almost a full four by eight sheet of plywood that was carved by hand. And then we did print it on a steamroller. And that's what you're seeing over here is our outdoor steamroller project. A lot of my earlier work ideas came from watching documentaries um, and sort of going externally into what was happening in the globe. And overfishing is something that was pretty heavily in the news for a while even to the point where um, there at one point was a fast food restaurant that couldn't offer their fish sandwich because that particular kind of fish was in such short supply. So I'm always listening for that, that sort of tone of idea that's happening out there in the world. But the idea that we would just sort of take as humans without considering the consequences of that or even seeing the consequences and then not knowing how to kind of push back um, has resulted in a piece like this. So my hope in a work like this, which is a one square foot, you're looking at about, I don't know, five to 7,000 individually hand gold leaf fish scales. The next question is always, where did you get fish scales? And of course I got them on eBay as one does. Um, so this piece took me and several other artists who work with me as studio assistants, um, a full year to create. So this was a hugely labor intensive piece. And my hope in making this is that as I go through the process with my quilting bee of folks working with me, and we are deeply considering what it is to make a fish skin, that the preciousness of that object will translate over to things like this, that we kind of slow down and reimagine um, our sensitivity to the natural world. So these are some of the process shots taken by my studio assistants who are students of mine. Uh, we have several programs here at the University of Dayton that affords students the opportunity to work with their faculty as research assistants. So they're getting a lot of professional practice as we go through. This upper left image, I like to point out that was my first go at making this. What you're looking at is 12 inches long by about an inch and a half, and that was about 100 hours of work. Uh, so then from there, I figured out a way to speed up the process. But I'm always, always thinking about my labor that I use as a surrogate for the natural world's labor. Coral reef bleaching is something that, of course, we've all seen um, in the news. <clears throat> that feels devastating to me. So in this next work that I'll show you, the question that I was asking was how do I create a coral reef and make it in a way that sort of elevates it into this space where humans will take it really seriously, the way that it was made. So in poking around on the internet, I stumbled across the couture houses of dressmakers in France mostly, and Coco Chanel in particular. Seems like a really strange uh, parallel to be making. But they actually publish images and videos of their couture makers making fabrics. So I studied those videos thanks to YouTube and figured out the processes and materials that people were using um, to make these highest end pieces of clothing. So this piece is made on raw silk using silk thread, and it's all individually hand beaded. 
And here are some images of me making it. It's never very glamorous in the studio. You know, it's just work by the time we get over there. But um, some of these are about half the size of a regular seed bead um, and on up. You can see some bigger images in here. So this piece took me two years to make. And I, you know, the the time doesn't matter to me. I'm happy to just be in the studio and be making. But when I think about uh, that time and then the time of the natural world, I can start to draw some connections. So this piece, I averaged about an inch an hour on sewing, so a square inch an hour. And some of the fastest growing corals average an inch a year. So it really is startling to um, draw those parallels and think about the fact that this took me two years to make, but I'm actually much faster than in the natural world. So moving forward into some prints, um, <clears throat> I love this little piece. This little piece came out of reading National Geographic. So I'm all, you know, at the beginning, sort of pulling at all these different cultural threads, documentaries, natural National Geographic, and this was an article about um, people trapping and capturing songbirds. So in the midst of that article was an image of two birds that were asleep, which I had never seen a sleeping bird before, but you hopefully can tell that their eyes are closed. And it really struck me as a sort of a visual metaphor for the natural world, thinking about um, the stillness and quietude, but still the strength of that space. So I made this image and just played around with it to make it this conjoined uh, conjoined bird. And I could probably write an entire paper <laughs> about this piece in particular and the visual information and the connection, um, the sleeping birds and the metaphor. But it's uh, interestingly, I think I figured out how to gold leaf paper and I made sure I wanted it to be really irregular, you know, to sort of have this like broken down edge. But I gold leafed the paper and then printed on top of that. So here's an image of me in the studio. There's the original image of the bird and then my drawings. And you can see that I took those two and then pieced them together. As a companion to that in 2019, I think was our last major cicada outbreak, which seemed sort of biblical in proportion. Uh, down here in Dayton, Ohio, there were cicadas sort of dropping from the trees. The sidewalks were coated with them. And one day I happened upon this, which is in my driveway of all things. And I believe these cicadas are mating, but it felt to me like a perfect pair to the double-headed birds to just sort of think about the natural world and what it might be prophesizing to us. So this is called Prophets for a Liminal Time, where, you know, in our current culture, in our politics, we're really asking questions about how we plan to engage with the preservation of the natural world. And so I see this piece and the double-headed birds as these, these sort of mystics and prophets for this time. I hope that makes sense. Ask questions at the end um, if you have them. So here I am working on uh, the carving. You can see my hand for scale. This piece is an, another very large woodcut. Um, you know, I sometimes think it would be nice to work smaller, but I can't quite get myself to do that. But this is a work where I was, it felt like a puzzle in my mind where I was thinking about the imagery of the plastic and the out, this is an albatross. There were images coming out at the time of an artist who was at Midway Island and was photographing the albatrosses um, as they had died on the island with plastics in their bellies. So again, that sensitivity and not quite being able to make sense out of all of these things and just sort of a deep pain uh, for the natural world. So I reimagined the albatross saving itself in this case. So it has the alba or the plastics around its neck that it's scooped out of the ocean and it has saved us. And there's an image of me working on it. For any printmakers out there, these images are really complicated to make sure that the grays all turn out appropriately and the textures are all lined up. 
So oftentimes I will color code my grays and that's what you're looking at here is that I've drawn the image on the block and then I've given each gray type um, a color so that I can carve it more easily. But it does, it just takes a lot of time. And I went back up to Manitowoc, Wisconsin to print this image as well. So I'm gonna transition a little bit here. Um, I was able to start traveling, which is something that um, I had always dreamed of doing. But especially as an artist and somebody who teaches ideas of place and being, it's been really critical to be in these immersive experiences, right? You can't imagine what it feels like to be in a rainforest. You have to be in the rainforest. So I've had the good fortune of traveling to different places and my experience with those locations has created artworks almost instantaneously. So a few years ago, I traveled to Denmark. Um, this is an image looking off into the North Sea. And it was the first time that I saw fishing nets at scale. So these bins, which are on the left, you can see them very barely at the bottom of that image were maybe 10 foot square. And this is a, on the right, a close up of those fishing nets. And the just the mass of that was shocking to me. And all of these are made out of nylon, which you know you can't tug or pull with your hands, the fish can't get out of it. So just that one experience um, sent me home and I, I taught myself how to make these traditional Scandinavian fishing nets. But here I made them out of cotton and bamboo fibers so that if you got them wet and a fish struggled, it would just break the net. So that is the impetus for the title, Casting Nets of Futility, made all of these beautiful nets, but they're all intended to break. The next year I had the good fortune of going to the Redwoods. And this was an opportunity for me to see the natural world in all of its glory. So there's very little human impact in some of these, um, in some of the deeper trails. So watching these old growths, trees that have fallen um, and have started to decay or are mostly decayed back into soil. And this is the work that's in On the Grid. Thank you, Kelly, for choosing this piece. So here's an overview if you haven't seen it in person. So this piece again is the cotton bamboo fibers. These are all hand dyed. And then again, working with students here at the university, we tie them all into pom-poms and then I sew them down. Um, you can see the images here. So many tiny pom-poms, so much fluff of yarn. Uh, but these are so fun to make. You know, when this is my influence, the making is just about play. This is about color and formalism and the grid and simply using nature as a jumping off point um, for making a really fun and beautiful piece. So I imagine this as sort of a holding point artwork. Being in the redwoods, it's impossible to not have access to all the statistics about how much of the redwoods aren't there anymore. Um, and so that's that's how the p or the title came to be this placeholder for posterity that I've made a portrait of that experience of the the forest floor. Portraits of place are becoming really critical for me um, in my work. So oops, sorry about that. This is another work that is in uh, the Rife Gallery right now on view, and I love talking about this artwork. It's so fun. Uh, this work came out of the pandemic. This is the result of me being in lockdown for six weeks in my yard. So I couldn't travel anymore. Um, my entire universe became this very small, you know, one sixteenth of an acre in suburban Dayton, Ohio, uh, where I had to start paying attention differently. So one of the experiences that I had in that time was of an orb weaver. You know, they are big spiders. They're very difficult to miss. They come out in the fall. And she built a web in our window. We have a big picture window that looks out into the street. And this spider came back day after day and repaired her web. And I was able to watch how she was making it, right? So there's this thread of connection of me replicating the natural world. So the web that you're seeing here is stitched by hand, again, using those couture fabric or couture dressmaking um, processes.
but also using that spider as my teacher. She's the one that taught me how to, how to do this. All of the stones are cast plaster. And then I will show you some process shots in a little while. Um, these are weeds that came out of my yard. I picked them out of the ground and put them in a jug of water, took them to the studio, and brushed them off very carefully, all of the soil, put them on the scanner. And then I was able to print that um, on some mylar paper. So I had whole pages of dandelion leaves. And then I used a laser cutter to cut those out. And again, students are working with me. I can't express how much Liza Lou has given me the ability to say my practice isn't just me. I can imagine things that I'm not capable of making in my lifetime through the use of others' skilled hands. So this is the other work that is in um, the Rife Gallery, those three pieces. And I love uh, this log because this came out of a friend of mine's yard and it was the perfect log because when you're up close in person with it, there are so many details that are important to me and require that kind of slow looking that we saw me doing when I was a kid on the beach looking at seashells. The mold making process um, was sensitive enough that you can see the little mushrooms that were growing on the side of the log, but you can also see the sort of drawn marks of the chainsaw that chopped this tree into the, the piece that you're seeing now. So that sort of dual interaction of the natural world and all of its beautiful glory, and then this remnant of the human mark on it um, simultaneously. This is another piece in that show called Three Sisters. I'm really thinking about reciprocity and relationship in nature and at home. And then lastly in this show, because we were all in our homes for so long, uh, I really got to know our visitors. <laughs> so we had a chipmunk living on the front porch and there was a rabbit that lived in the flower garden. And because that was the only thing that I was looking at and noticing, um, they became really important uh, beings in my life at that time. All of the titles of these work, I really tried to capture the thoughts of lockdown and our early COVID experience because it was so specific and now it feels like it was so fleeting. This idea that we were talking to our loved ones between glass, um, the, the world was so silent all of a sudden. You know, I, I really tried to hold on to and capture those ideas. So Here's an image of me working in the studio. I hope you all love seeing the images of the studio as much as I like showing them. It's such a different experience than um, seeing artwork that's finished. My relationship with process is so rich and I wish that the studio itself could become the gallery or the museum sometimes. So this is the log. You can see all the mushrooms that were growing on it um, and it was, this was one of the most fascinating experiments that I've done in my professional life. This log was very alive when I brought it into this institutional studio space. There were bugs living in it. It was had moisture in it. And it. I had to watch it go through the process of death, essentially, so that I could cast it and preserve it over time. Um, so I had to spray it with plastic, which felt, you know, all of these steps I'm really thinking through and intellectualizing the way that that impacts the, the content of the work. But I had to coat it in plastic so that I could um, have the mold release from the log without catching all of the bark. Um, and so there you're seeing all of the vents that keep me safe while I'm doing that. And the images are all hand drawn. Uh, when we go back to this guy, this is a hand-drawn image that's been scanned and turned into a vector so that it can be blown up um, at a larger scale. So this is the original drawing. And here are some of the prints of the weeds. It's kind of nice to see that in process. It's hard to imagine, I think, how these would be made. Uh, and then I used a Glowforge, which is an at-home laser cutter. And I was able to overlay the the vector drawing of those plants um, right on top so that it would draw around my images for me. And the Glowforge is the only one that does that so far. So that was fantastic. I'm really used to an interactive Q&A here. So I'm I'm missing seeing the, the audience a little bit. Um, so here's another transition. 
This last spring, I was on sabbatical, and this has been one of the most transformative experiences of my professional life and largely because academia is just very busy. Uh, I'm, I'm kept busy from morning, noon, and night at the university and my opportunities to be a slow maker are sort of confined to little pockets. So I essentially had nine months to do nothing but think my thoughts um, and test murky, unclear territory as Judy Pfaff says. So the first thing that I did on my sabbatical was take all of the images that I'd been looking at as inspiration and put them up on the wall. So it was an externalization of my brain. Um, and I started making work about my family. I've never made work that's personal. I've always been on the outside um, and you know, using the internal to make that happen. But this is the first time that I actually looked at myself deeply um, to make work. I also taught myself how to do natural dyeing. The materials are always part of our language. So the idea that I could make artwork about my grandfather that had um, walnut or chestnut as part of the, uh, the base of the making, which is also part of the lore of his life, um, I, it just felt like a perfect match. So my goal was not only to do the natural dyeing with fabrics, and here's part of my catalog of colors, but also to teach myself how to print with those natural dyes. My roots are in printmaking and it seemed like an easy enough crossover. So some of the early works um, that I made that are probably never gonna be shown, this may be the only time that you see these is in this art talk, artist talk. This is a piece that I was really trying to make a portrait of my maternal grandfather looking deeply into the woods. Um, this is printed with black walnut and iron. And just trying to build these sort of visual representations, these portraits of people through place. The image on the left for me represents my maternal grandmother, and on the right, my paternal grandmother. And really, now we're into the not finished, in progress, raw and gritty works that are happening in the studio right now. So those pieces that started about my family that were portraits of my grandparents turned very quickly into my nuclear family at home. Um, and we have a thing about wild geese in our house, thanks to the Mary Oliver poem um, called Wild Geese. We're always looking at them. And she says at the end of the poem that you're to hear the wild geese and notice them to remember your place in the midst of the world, right? So they're sort of this representation. So this is the flying, the flying goose pattern that comes out of Appalachian quilting. And I'm just playing around with that with a color. I have no idea where these works are going, but I'm really excited to be part of the process. Uh, I do have um, an exhibition coming up in January where I have to have made some sort of conclusions. So I love that deadline for helping me to do that. Um, but again, what is the purpose of an artist talk? To help y'all to get to know me a little bit and a bit about my process. And there's nothing more process oriented than what's happening right now. So this is a, a sample of a double wedding ring pattern. I am in love with these colors and the tactility of the fibers um, and really just the process of making it. I've been making drawings of my house plants and thinking about longevity and time and sort of like, you know, there's a weed that grows up in your yard and it dies over winter, but it comes back the next year, that sort of regenerative process of time and living. Uh, this rubber tree on the left is a plant that my husband's been growing for about 20 years. And I, I just love that familial lore and the fact that I can look at this piece that this plant and have this sort of magic quality that comes up when I think about it. To me, this is an object full of magic. And the way that I make it then, my goal will be to sort of translate that to the viewer. This is an aloe plant that we gave each other for an anniversary that's propagated all kinds of babies. So there's a whole family of aloes. Um, and this piece was really, this is the turning point for me where I realize I'm doing something different. So we're almost to the end and then we'll open it up for questions. 
But through that experience of sabbatical, I started with one question and I've ended with a completely different one, but I couldn't have gotten there without going through all of those steps. And like I said a minute ago, I've never made work that was truly about me, but this is really my life. On the right, you're looking at the dimensions of my shower. Uh, it's a place where I gather peace and I can hear my thoughts and no one is in there bothering me. I have two small children, so that helps to provide context. Um, and in the bathroom with the door mostly shut is a place, again, where I can sort of gather my thoughts. These places are locations where if you came to my home, you probably wouldn't have access to them, right? This is, to me, very intimate. Um, the interior of the interior of uncurated spaces and experiences uh, that really get to the bareness of my life. And this is our last slide here today. I was talking to Kat again before this started and sharing with her that as an educator, I've been wondering a lot about gatekeeping of content. In my classroom, <clears throat> I'm always asking my students to really think about who they are and cultivate that sense of self and question it and bring all of their interests forward because there's no wasted experience or interest in life. So this idea of gatekeeping, I gave a lecture a few months ago when this image of my cat Nico was fresh, hot off the press. And the words that came out of my mouth were, this is the least high fine art thing that I've ever done in my life. And then I thought, who is keeping track of this? If we're asking our emerging artists to be themselves as much as possible, then I should have the right to do that as well. And if this is a truly intimate space for me, um, that's showing what my life is and helping me to be an artist of now, then these are images that are important to show. And that is the conclusion. If you'd like to see more of my work, my website is there. And I'll turn it over to Kat now for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah, folks, if you have questions, pop them into the chat and I will read them out. Um, so we have a question. You mentioned the importance and influence of community engaging with creating work. How do you go about creating and crediting community in your work? That is a great question. Um, I always include it in my artist statement. It's really important to me. How I can't list all of the artists that have worked with me over the, over time. Um, but it is on my list to cite each of them in my website so that, you know, they all have that credit. But it's always a part of my artist talks. It's always a part of my artist statement um, that I'm talking about the fact that I'm working with a community of folks. And that has an activism component to it, right? If I'm thinking about our relationship with the natural world and the way that our life affects it, then I it's it. I sort of owe it to the world to bring other people into that conversation so that they can then proliferate that back out. I hope that answers the question. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, how is it that you suggest or hope to inspire students to find their artistic voice? That's a big question, Kat. I feel like I could write a paper about that. Um, there's... The, the classroom for me is a very curated space. It is undoubtedly a performance when I'm in there because I truly believe in the work that we do as makers. And I, I know for sure that the world needs what we give, right? So first of all, helping people to know how important the work is that we're undertaking in the classroom, that our job is to be objective viewers of the world around us. And to sort of perceive and be aware and filter all of this information and then through the lens of ourselves, give it back to the to the world. And galleries and museums are then the storehouses and the collectors of those objects, which are really a, a timeline of human history. Right. That's what art is and what art objects are. Our responsibility is to be humans in human bodies, having human experiences and then share that, right? So I can't be honest with you if I can't be honest with me. So really cultivating a space of trust and a little bit of magic, I think that goes quite a long way. Play, 
um, lots of different experiences. I draw from my grandparents who took us to every museum in Ohio. You never know what's going to stick with a student. I have a quote on my wall that says students learn both more and less than what we intend to teach. And that really um, helps me. You never know what the latent learning will be. So just provide experiences. I could get more in detail, but that's my overarching <laughs> pedagogy. Great. Um, we have a couple more questions. In a world of fast paced social media scrolling and posting in the art world, how have you navigated your relationship with social media and or getting your work out there? Mm. That is such a beautiful question that I struggle with and think about regularly. I'm not a good social media content creator, but I do know that it's a powerful tool. I once heard a curator say that they struggle to find folks if they're not on social media, that they're finding a lot of artists through Instagram and you know like-minded platforms. So my Instagram does have my work on it. Um, it does have process shots from time to time. I'll do um, event notices like I did today, but it's not something that I feel like I can keep up with. I tried during my sabbatical. I gave it a good college try um, because I was so excited to show people what's happening in the studio. And I think that's what's really great about social media is these behind the scenes looks. It's a great question, Kat. I don't have an answer. I do my best with social media, but my relationship with the studio is the most important thing to me. Um, and I know that that will come out in the work and, you know, in situations like that. I want to have a chat with the person that asked that question. I think that's a really great question. That was Morgan Bukov. All right. Bukovic. Thank you. Yep. Um, Kelly asks, um, I'm excited to see the recent Turning Point work about personal space, which seems to be about small, limited moments of anti-labor. Do you mm. feel like this will be a place where smaller moments of work or reflection happen? That's a great question, Kelly. Um, unfortunately, the piece on the left there was printed and then hand embroidered. So I think the ship sailed for me. <laughs> <laughs> making smaller, smaller moments of labor, but it is very pared down visually. You know, it's all two colors, essentially variations on this magenta, but the labor is really, the labor is actually very slow for me. That does slow me down. So even though it's a lot of work, it's a very slow process um, and very quiet. So the process is really mirroring my experience in these spaces. Um, Jeremy asks, have you experienced a creative block or artist block in the middle of your artwork and how do you overcome it? I did. I had a few years actually where I had a significant and severe artist block. Um, and so what was happening, if we go back and you think through the work that I've shown you, where I was looking out at all of these global experiences of the relationship with the human world. And then we had a time in our American politics where environmental regulations were being rolled back and nothing really felt safe anymore. And I felt like I could no longer say to my viewer, you're complicit in this, look at what we're doing. And I had to turn to something else. And I didn't know what that was and that not knowing lasted me two years. <laughs> so what I did was show up in the studio anyway I had some great mentors in my life that said, it's not your job to, to, you know, figure out anything other than showing up and doing the work. So I don't, well, I have one for my class. I keep these books. These are called idea files. I have a couple of former students on the Zoom, so you'll, re you'll recognize these, but it's just like work for work's sake. I have pockets in here with images that I'm interested in. Um, I make little zines sometimes, and this is photographs that I've taken also on my books. It's just showing up and doing the work and keeping your mind busy. And then also reading. Um, the thing that got me out of my artist's block was an article by Rebecca Solnit that she wrote to Greta Thunberg. And it was all about the work of now uh, with environmental activism. And she suggested that we have to turn toward hope. What will be the motivator for all of us to change our behaviors and for corporate behaviors to change and for us to put pressure on folks to do that? Um, 
so yeah, what's in the zeitgeist that always helps me pretty significantly. Uh, Shelby says, I appreciate your use of traditionally feminine materials and processes, yarn, quilting, that create an illusion of both very natural and familiar substances, moss, tile. Is your priority in your process to reflect the object or substance realistically or create a sense of uncanny valley where the artwork looks like the real thing, but something's off? In other words, is it more important to be realistic or expressive, suggestion, suggestive in your process? That's a great question, Shelby. And I think all of the above is the answer. There are moments where the replication is really critical. But um, as a graduate student, I did a lot of research about surrogacy, right? And like replicating, but not quite, and things being slightly off. So all of that has become so natural in my language and the way that I make at this point that you hit on all of the notes, all of the above is the answer. Um, so even looking at this image that's up right now of the bathroom, this is my first attempt at dyeing with indigo and it went wrong, right? So it should be all one color and I did a terrible job, but then I'm like, oh, well that just looks like a wet shower tile. Right. So that sort of like loose replication um, is such a beautiful and magical place to me. I also teach foundation. So I'm it's densely steeped in things like the Gestalt principles, <laughs> right, where we study um, the notion of closure, where the human mind only needs a small amount of information in order to start figuring out what's happening. So I'm counting on that. I'm telling you like a whispered secret and then letting your brain fill in the rest of the information. Love that. And she says, love that. I appreciate drawing attention to the mundane and undervalued overlooked through women's work. Thank you for elaborating. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, Emily, you know, a really key component for a sustainable art practice is, um, you know, showing up, obviously, but in the evolution of it is deep curiosity. And so how then do you help to cultivate that in students where um, perhaps that hasn't been um, something expressly valued um, just within culture writ large? So how, how do you help students to cultivate uh, curiosity and how do you support your own? Oh, I love this question, Kat. I feel, oh my goodness, that is such a good question. Curiosity is one of my life mantras. Even when I think about going into conflict, I come into it from a point of curiosity. I wonder what, et cetera. Um, and it, that, that notion of curiosity is so um, sort of tame and acceptable in, on the one hand and like beautiful and pure on another. So I, I did say before, and I'm, this is an arguable point that we could talk about for a while, but when I'm in the classroom, I'm doing a thing, right? I'm showing up as an art professor to curate this experience for students. So the first thing that I do is model curiosity. I am a deeply curious person. I get so excited about all of the things that are happening. It's almost too much sometimes. Um, and I think that what I notice in the students is that that becomes infectious. I'm curious about them. I'm curious about their work. I'm curious about the small, tiny moments that grow legs and become new things. So that sort of performative part of teaching, which is honest and genuine, the performance doesn't mean it's disingenuous, but um, really trying to model that for them and be involved in their lives as a, an artist and as a mentor and slowing down. Um, messaging and cell phones and email are not allowed in my classroom. It's maybe generational, but it's a hard stop point for me because we are, our attention is being pulled in so many different directions. I can't, I can't handle that. And so I imagine that they also as humans have a hard time with that. Um, we, we slow down, we went out and did a listening map recently where we sat for 20 minutes and drew maps of what we heard. So really trying to engage those senses. Um, and in my own life, if I have a moment of quiet, 
I'll ask myself sometimes, what can I hear? How many layers down can I hear? What can I see? How many layers deep can I see? So just really trying to engage all of my senses. And I always make discoveries. There's always something there. I love that. Well, um, we're close to time. So I will finish out with the question. Um, what is it that you'd like to leave us with in your artist talk? Mm. Well, I suppose the thing that I've been thinking about lately is the deep embodiment of the artist practice and my my hope and goal for humanity that we would all have some access to that. It, to me, it feels like everything I do now is part of my practice. There's no separation. This deep well of, of ideas is everywhere. Um, and there's no bad starting point, right? Just get started and show up in the studio. There are lots of things that I make that will never go anywhere, but just that action of doing the thing, um, it's like, right, you know, keeping your muscles in shape. Um, it helps. So keep making, y'all. Perfect. Thank you again, Emily, for the Very generosity good. of your time and talent. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, as a part of our programming for the On the Grid exhibition and a special shout out and thank you to our curator, Kelly Dietrich. Big thank you to the other participating artists as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great day.